Fairy Souls, it is Nina. You are watching Fairy Chamber channel. I am going to start a new series in my channel starting from this moment. And because I tend to follow the Finnish Pagan Wheel of the Year, my new year really starts from Kekri, which is uh, celebrated in the beginning of November. Well, it is still October when I am filming this, but soon it will be November. So I'm going to research different goddesses from different parts of the world and their archetypes and the hidden meanings behind them. So I'm going to do one goddess each month. So I'm going to focus on one female deity or a goddess each month and going to go very deep in the mythos and stories behind them. None of them, not all of them are goddesses, but most of them are goddesses. So this some of these characters will be Baba Yaga and maybe something more about Hestia and Pekate and uh, Inanna and probably also Mary Magdalene because I find her quite interesting and definitely Lamia and Lilith. Those are some of the goddesses and figures I'm going to talk to you about in the near future. But this video is dedicated to the fairy queen, the queen mad. And most of you probably haven't never heard about queen mad. And she's goddess that it's quite difficult to find any information if you aren't previously familiar with her. And if you have ever watched BBC's Merlin or Hallmark version of Merlin from 1999, I think. Or if you are a big fan of, Sh of Shakespeare, then you might know Queen Mab. Some of you might know this already, but when people ask me about my pagan practice, or am I part of some coven or some particular pagan group, and the answer for is always no, I'm not really part of any group, or I don't follow any particular path, but I call myself as a fairy shaman. And a fairy shaman, in a nutshell, is a person who practices shamanism and mainly works with nature spirits, aka fairies. So, Queen Mab, she is the mother of all fairy shamans. She is the high priestess who I work with. <laughs> so, when I was seven, I had this very... Uh, divine divine experience that uh, I was on my way to school and in Finland we start school when we are seven and uh, it was beautiful August day and I was so happy and nervous to go to school but then there was this beautiful tree in this road which I always took to the school I can still like you know, picture the road in my head and there was these rowan trees growing there in that road in the <laughs> grass near the road so I went to sit under the rowan tree because I like to sit under the trees and I was supposed to go to school but I decided to go to sit under the tree and I was looking the uh, sun coming sunlight coming through the leaves and I started to see these figures in the trees remember I was seven <laughs> and they looked like little people little persons with wings and I heard laughter and I heard this tinker uh, like the tinker bells <laughs> with like extinguish human figures made of light and I was just sitting there watching them for a moment or it felt like a moment <laughs> then the lady who was looking after me after school and my sister who was younger and other kids and uh, she and the other kids, they came to the, to the road and suddenly she was shouting, Nina, why are you not in school? And then the fairies were gone suddenly, the sun went back behind the clouds and the music stopped back to the reality. And I went, went to school and later on the, the lady who took care of me, I don't know, Nanny, I think that's the word. She told my mom that I might be a bit out of ditch this world, which was quite funny. But anyway, that was my first experience with fairies. 
And later on, as an adult, I tried to analyze this. Maybe I fall asleep or something. But even if I did fall asleep, which is totally possible and totally fine, it was still a very profound experience for me or amazing dream. So uh, then when I was um, an adult, one of my pagan friends later on told me that I was maybe kidnapped by fairies or something. So maybe I was kidnapped by fairies or maybe I just fall asleep or maybe they just came to me from other worlds. That was my first fairy experience, fairy encounter. A um, few years after that, I remember being at my grandma's home and she had this lovely uh, back garden filled with apple trees. So every time when I, I like visited her, I climbed into those apple trees and there I had similar experiences seeing those shapes in the uh, trees. Lots of fairy connections with trees, I know. <laughs> so I had lots of that kind of experiences as a child. And then sometimes in my own home back garden, similar things happened. But then I didn't see the shapes anymore. I just saw these fairy balls or light balls. And they just, you know, were dancing in the air. Dancing in the air. And the more older I got, the less I started to see them, and it was quite sad. And then when I was uh, in my teenage years, I had this massive fairy era when it came to my artworks. Like, um, when I was like uh, 11, 12, that's when I really started to get into paganism and started to research about Wicca and other nature-based religions, Buddhism as well, and Hinduism and Christianity, all kinds of religions. I was very drawn to the idea of goddess and Mother Earth. And uh, I was really a Mother Earth worshipper when I was from age of 15 to age of 19. After that, it changed a bit more of what I am now, more of a shamanic. But anyway, when I was like in upper elementary school from age 13 to 16, I think, I had this massive fairy era and the myths that I studied at the time, they were all about the fairies. I My room was covered with Victorian fairy art books and fairy myths all over the world and I was also studying Finnish mythology at the time and still study Finnish mythology and still study fairies. but. That's when it started and those were the areas that I was very focused at that time and there was few years that I only painted fairies, only fairies, nothing else, no animals, no landscape, nothing else, only fairies. I painted small fairies, I painted big fairies, like from age of 13 to age of 15 I probably painted like 50 fairy paintings. And I was just painting fairies, and I was I I was obsessed with fairies, and that's when I uh, started to find out about the about the queen map. Like I already knew the archetype of the fairy queen because you can find the archetype of the fairy queen really around the world. You can find different types of fairy queens from different cultures and with different names. Queen map is a character from Welsh mythology and uh, she is the queen of the fairies within Welsh mythology. When we start to research the story and myths about the queen map, we need to travel back in history for a very long period, all the way to the Paleolithic eras. And Britain, there has been people living here for a long time, the first Nandern Neanderthal people lived in Wales about 200,000 years ago already. Back then my home country was still covered with ice. <laughs> anyway, but then there was the Homo sapiens. Uh, proof of Homo sapiens living in Wales date about 30,000 years back. And from 30,000 years back, there's also evidences of early goddess cult. And Queen Map, she is part of the goddess cult, as you can probably guess. 
So it is very likely that Queen Mab is an old Welsh goddess. And in Welsh mythology, there's lots of really cool goddesses. And then many of the goddesses, we don't have lots of information about them really. And the information that we have, many of that was written down by the Romans or the Greeks or later on by the Christian priests and monasteries written down, writing down all the mythos. So there isn't lots of information from the actual Welsh pagans. So all these male writers that did not represent the old fate, they did not properly pay that much attention to a goddess who was connected to the fairies. And in Welsh mythology, there's very cool, interesting goddesses. There's Rhiannon, there's Arianhod, there's uh, Modron, there's Keridwen, who's one of my favorites. And all these Welsh deities, they represent certain um, goddess archetype. But there's one archetype that is completely missing from when we talk about the Ke uh, Welsh mythology in a wider sense, because we have have the warrior goddess there, we have the goddess of love, we have goddess of beauty, we have goddess of magic, Keritren. <laughs> um, but then there is also the goddess of fate that is pretty much missing. And um, I've read uh, this, this research that I've been doing from Queen Mab. I've been, I've been doing it for, <laughs> for a long time, obviously. It's really hard to find lots of information about her. But the, what I have been finding out is that she was probably an old uh, Welsh pagan goddess connected to fate because her symbol is the spinning wheel. So she is a spinner goddess and goddess of fate. And uh, also I find out when I've been studying different Welsh goddesses that sometimes goddesses like Rhiannon and Modron they are sometimes seen as the one and the same goddess and also sometimes Queen Mab is connected to Rhiannon and Modron. And this might be true or it might not be true, but uh, this is how the goddess archetype really works. Because all these deities, they are different aspects of the goddess energy. Queen Mab, her Welsh name is really Maev or Queen Maev or Queen Maeve. I'm going to use the word Queen Mab, the name Queen Mab, because uh, I'm used to use that name. I hope she doesn't mind. I actually sometimes in my mind call her Your Majesty because she's the Queen of the Fairies. So I have very deep connection to Queen Mab and I just uh, love everything that she represents. Queen Mab, she is a Welsh goddess of the fairies. She is the highest of the fairies, queen of the fairies obviously, and she's connected to fate, enchantment, imaginations, imagination, dreams and dreaming. And there's different um, ideas where her name is derived because Map is Welsh, M-A-B, uh, that literally is uh, Welsh and it means a child. And that itself could refer to the idea that Queen Mab is the goddess of the fairies and what fairies are for. Well, they are all about imagination and dreams and that's what children do best. So there might be a connection there. Then there is Welsh and Irish name Maev, which actually refers to mead. And this um, might have some to do with the fact that bees, butterflies and bugs are sacred animals to Queen Mab. So we don't really know where the name comes from. In maps, we sometimes refer to this Irish uh, queen called Maev. And the Irish Maev was a warrior queen, but she and the Welsh queen map, they're not the same. As Irish Maev was actually a, a real human being. She's um, historically existed. She was actual warrior queen in ancient Ireland. There has been some mixing there in the myths because later on the Welsh uh, fairy queen has gotten these warrior-like elements from the Irish Queen Maev and then in Ireland the Queen Maev, she has uh, later on gotten some elements from this fairy queen 
like the idea that maybe Queen Maev, the this real actual human being who lived, was like um, very really came from a fairyland or something. So this mixing of the myths there. First literal mentions of Queen Mab, they actually come from 16th century literature from Shakespeare, who wrote about Queen Mab in Romeo and Juliet, and there he describes Queen Mab to be the queen of the fairies, who in, is in charge of people's dreams and dreaming, and she is the midwife of the fairies. According to Shakespeare, Queen Mab was the bringer of nightmares, so when we research this description of Queen Mab from 16th century, this has gone quite a big transformation from the actual way people used to worship Queen Mab during the pagan times. And uh, definitely when, when um, William Shakespeare was around, uh, England was a Protestant country and all these fairies and goddesses they were quite romanticized and many of them were also demonized at the same time. You can find stories from fairies all around the world, different types of fairies. I personally, when I think about the word fairy, I usually translate that as a nature spirit, but fairy can also refer into a ghost or a spirit of a, of a dead person or Anything invisible spirit, they can also all be fairies, you know. You have watched my uh, series on fairy species, there's tons of different types of fairies. And of, obviously here in Britain there's very rich fairy lore, fairy culture. In Ireland there's Tuatha de Danann and Sithe, Shay, I think that's the Gaelish pronunciation. Then here in Welsh, there is also tons of different fairy species. I think there's over 10 different types of fairies. And fairy people in Welsh is Talvite. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Talvite. Talvite. And uh, there's lots of uh, different beliefs for the fairies. And I personally, after doing these years and years and years of research on fairies, I think fairies were really the role models for Christian angels because uh, way before Christianity and Islam and Judaism and other these male dominant religions arrived, people worshipped the goddess and before that people worshipped, you know, totemistic uh, things like animal spirits. But anyway, uh, the older idea where the angels delivered. You can find that from many different cultures. That is uh, the concept of the guardian angel. For example, in Finland, my home country, uh, there's quite interesting um, mythos about the fairies or elves, how they are like we call them. Uh, that is, each person when they were born, they got their own Haltia, which was like a guardian fairy. You can find the similar concept also from ancient Middle East. You can find this from Arabic countries. And also you can find this from Scandinavia. You can find this from Middle, Middle Europe. You can find this from different parts of the world. The concept that people have their own guardian fairy. And this uh, idea is very very old maybe comes from that paleolithic era where people worship the goddess or mother earth or different groups of deities that everyone had their own guardian fairy so i personally believe that the whole concept of guardian angels really comes from guardian fairies and uh, queen mab is actually a big part of this whole concept because uh, the Queen Map was referred to be a triple goddess because she is connected to this idea of matrons and the matrons or matronas or um, what's the word? Divine mothers. It's this concept of three goddess, group of three goddess that guard the person through their whole life. When Queen Map was considered to be the 
bringer of the fairies and midwife of the fairies. The thing is, giving birth in the goddess-based cultures, that was seen as a sacred ritual. And this can be found also from uh, all different parts of the world. Giving birth and everything related to birth and blood and, and well, vagina in general was something very sacred and holy. So it actually might refer into that when the Queen Mad was worshipped as a goddess of the fate, the women, the mothers who were giving birth, prayed her for protection and also giving birth was also connected to fate, what was going to be the fate of the child. And this brings us back to the idea of the fairy godmother and this whole fairy tale concept of having three fairy godmothers that each child has these godmothers who give them these gifts and different attributes. So all these can be connected to Queen Mab uh, and to her as a goddess of fate. Here in Wales there's two words to describe the fairies, fairies as a race or fairies as creatures, fairy people, fairy folk. So Talbite is first one. That literally means fairy people. And there is also Benit i Mamao. That means blessings of the mothers. Benit i Mamao. So <laughs> in that sense, the fairies are the children of these goddess of, goddesses of fate. Or one goddess of fate. Because uh, often different goddess goddesses, they have the three triple aspect, at least when it comes to Celtic goddesses. You know, there's maiden mother crow, or then these goddesses just appear in the groups of three. And definitely when we think about different myths around the world about different goddesses of fate, well, in Norse mythology we have uh, three spinners, you can find them from Germanic mythology, you can find them from Finnish mythology, you can find them also from Greek mythology, you can f predate them to um, Africa slash India, and uh, you can find them from many different places. So the whole idea of the Benedict Imamo is that fairies are children of the fate goddesses. So this automatically makes the queen map the queen of the fairies because she represents these three fate goddesses being the ultimate goddess of fate. You probably might already guess that the whole idea of having fairy godmother also comes from this idea. The whole concept of the fate being personified, that is extremely old. You can find that already from different shamanic cultures. If you like BBC's Merlin, you might have seen Queen Mab there. She was a tiny fairy queen and she's uh, told riddles for the uh, Merlin to solve. Then there is my favorite Merlin version, that is Hallmark version from 1999. I think I was 14 or 15 when I saw it for the first time and I was really obsessed with it for a long time. I was obsessed with fairies and that one is really great one if you haven't seen it. Miranda Rickardson plays Queen Mab in it and she was brilliant. She was really scary and she was funny and she she was the villain in that series but you kind of forgive her because she's doing all kinds of evil things to protect her people and her people are the fairies and all the magical creatures and she's always like I am here to protect the magic and I will protect it no matter what it costs. So then she does all kinds of evil things. It's really good, good show. There's um, Sam Neill plays Merlin and uh, Isabel Rossellini is Nimue. Helena Bonham Carter was Morgan Le Fay and the lady who plays Cersei Lannister in Game of Thrones. She was Guinevere, so it's very old school, but it's my favorite adaptation of Merlin. <laughs> I need to make a whole another video for the ad Merlin ad adaptations. But that's that is a very very uh, good um, interesting presentation of Queen Map. 
it's not super true, but it comes to Queen Rab in the original Welsh mythology. It, it the series it really focuses on this idea that Christianity is is arriving into Britain, and then the people don't people stop believing to pagan gods and goddesses and magic. So in the series, Queen Rab creates Merlin. Uh, to restore the old uh, pagan faith for people but it happens that because Queen Mab uses evil ways to do this Merlin decides to fight against Queen Mab and in a way welcomes Christianity to Wales and England so it's a bit controversial for a pagan but I still love that series and um, Merlin really becomes this um, bridge between the old pagan ways and the new Christian ways. So in a way when the in the series Queen Mab creates Merlin, she creates her enemy, but yet uh, Merlin who share shares the story of Map Map and other fairies still in a way keeps Map alive and the belief for the magic alive. So it's really interesting. And it's actually quite close to the original myth about Merlin. And of course, uh, the whole concept of Merlin that varies a lot because there's so many different stories about it. And I personally don't think Merlin was one actual figure. I think he was based on several different druids. And most of the stories about Merlin, they come from here in Wales. Um, they probably from a druid or a or a bard called Merim, and his name uh, means the sea, if I remember right. And and um, according to the myth, there's actually several version of Merlin, how Merlin came to be. But there's a Christianized myth that Merlin was a son of a nun and a Christian devil. And this is definitely Christianized myth because, you know, Merlin is a druid, he cannot be fully a real person. <laughs> and then there is a, an, one myth that Mer, uh, Queen Mab created Merlin, that uh, fairies created Merlin, which also, which is, uh, the, and this is the myth that obviously makers of the TV series used. Then there is a myth that I think is most closest to the whole concept of Merlin being part of the Welsh mythology and that is the idea that Merlin is a, was a son of a mortal woman and a son of a water spirit. And this goes hand in hand with the fact that um, the etymology behind the name Merlin refers to mer, water. So that's my personal uh, opinion, <laughs> that that's the whole idea where the myth comes. But then if we really think who was the real Merlin, because there probably was all different kinds of famous druids in the past. And in all the myths about the Merlin, it is said that Merlin did not have a father, so he was a bastard child. Um, I think he was like Jesus. The mother was a nun and the father was a Roman soldier, period. Anyone who wants to research the myth of Merlin, first thing they have to accept is the fact that there is so many versions that you cannot really find out what, what, what is true and what is not. It's impossible. So it is very likely that originally Queen Mab was a goddess of fate. And then when there was these invaders and new belief system coming to Wales, she was um, minimized to be a fairy queen or a creature from some other realm not so close to the human lives like goddesses of fate have been. People have worshipped the goddesses of fate around the world in Baltic countries, in in Finland, in Scandinavia, in Southern Europe, everywhere people have been worshipping different goddesses of fate. There are symbols connected to Queen Mab. Her stone is the agate. 
the colors are purple, violet, black and blue and her planets are moon and mercury and her elements that she represents are water and earth water refers into imagination because she is the goddess of imagination what you think is uh, what you can achieve and also the earth element is the fact that she is a fairy she is connected to the forest trees everything in the earth leaves mushrooms uh, uh, what's the word foliage <laughs> change of seasons uh, some of the symbols of queen map are spinning wheel and spider webs and butterflies in Wales there's a very rich history when it comes to fairies and obviously many of these stories they were told orally and also the stories of Queen Map they were told orally and you can really read between the lines which stories have more Christian elements and which not and many times these stories like uh, like the Shakespeare story where Queen Map is some kind of bringer of nightmares and takes uh, children away from their parents and switches fairy children there like that is demonizing the fairy queen and it didn't really uh, fit to the idea of the queen map or the this loving uh, goddess of imagination and goddess of fate the fairy godmother and it fits to the idea of fairies in general because there's so many uh, ideas what kind of fairy is and even in Wales there is 10 different types of fairy species that I'm going to go through some of them soon so in Wales some of the beliefs for the fairies were that fairies created fairy rings and they danced until we take fairies they were believed to be beautiful fairies like Lord of the Rings type fairies and uh, they could change their size, they could come out as human size and they could come out like small fairy creatures and it was believed that Tavite, they lived underwater or they lived in um, underground and it was believed that many of the fairies they lived in the Iceland of Mon which in English is Anglesey actually I'm not, I'm not too far from Anglesey and uh, it's this uh, big island here in North Wales um, that's believed to be one of the places where where fairies lived, and it's actually be, be, to be, be, uh, believed to be one of the places where Merlin also lived at one point of his life. Interestingly enough, and um, in Wales, fairies you had to treat them with respect. And fairies could favor a person if they liked the person and if the person was respectful for them they could give the person riches but then those riches could vanish just like that if you were disrespectful for the fairies. Some of the Welsh fairy species were the Elil and uh, Elil were, were like elves <laughs> and they could be the small pixies, they were wispy ethereal, they like to eat toads too and and um, they were nature spirits they lived in crows and they lived in valleys they were small and some of them had wings and they were mostly believed to live in Anglesey or in the Iceland of Mon and also in different hilly parts of Wales and they were also cattle herders and they get tiny cows this is very some this sounds very familiar because you can find this also from Finnish mythology and Sami mythology and probably probably from many other myths as well and it's interesting because in Wales it was believed that Elil that's the singular for the fairy and Elilon is the plural <laughs> Elilon uh, they really liked children and they were fascinated by human children so there's lots of these myths from different parts of the world where fairies snatch human children and switch their own ugly children to the human children and the thing is they were beautiful, they were gorgeous creatures 
probably still are gorgeous creatures. Creatures. Why would they want to change a beautiful child to a human child? So they didn't want to steal human babies. They just like to admire them and they like to play with them. And this made me think of Peter Pan <laughs> and the way in the Peter Pan story um, fairies are born when babies laugh. And think that's how Tinkerbell was born, so maybe there's connection there. And there's also Goblinau fairies. And Goblinau is like a Welsh version of Goblin. And they were really ugly and they were in the mind, surprise, surprise. Then there was Quillian. And Quillian, that can mean tons of different things in Welsh. It can mean a, go mean a ghost or a maleficent, maleficent spirit. And uh, they were usually evil hacks, so they were more like a witch stereotype. Or more reasons to clap your hands and say, I do believe in fairies. You can believe I have extremely divided relationship to the whole story of Peter Pan, because in many ways it has destroyed a lot of the imaginative image imagery of the fairies and pretty nice fairies and then there's lots of stuff there that is true to fairy mythology but yeah me and Peter Pan even more with Tinkerbell so it was believed that Queen Mab was the queen of all these fairy creatures in Wales and there's stories that Queen Mab she herself lived in the Island Iceland of Mon and she had her court there somewhere underground, maybe in Snowdonia, who knows. Queen Map, she was originally goddess Map, goddess of fate, goddess of imagination, goddess of dreams, dreaming, creative thinking, and she was the one that was holding life in its place because she read people's destinies together, she's the destiny goddess, goddess of destiny and then when the with uh, different effects from from different belief systems uh, that came uh, she was minimized to be the fairy queen the archetype of a fairy queen still fairy queen is a very powerful archetype fairy queen represents the same things that goddess map but she is and minimized because there's so much bad things connected to fairies like the idea that fairies were always uh, tricking people or that they switched their children to human children and that many of the fairies with Christianity were believed to be fallen angels when I think it's really otherwise that fairies were the actual first angels <laughs> so that's what happened to Queen Mab and uh, Queen Mab, Goddess Mab, Mab, Mab is a very very powerful goddess to work with, very very powerful fairy to work with if you want to go with the word fairy. I love Queen Mab. Queen Mab is uh, someone who I work with day to day basis really because I love, still love to paint fairies and all kinds of fantasy creatures and to me working with Queen Map is very simple I just need to imagine things then I am working already with Goddess Map I will show you some of my Queen Map artworks this is probably the oldest one that I have here this is actually a print from a drawing and this is the Queen Map herself. I think I made this when I was 18 or something. So there's Queen Map on her chair. This is really inspired by Blackmore's Night Song, Fairy Queen, and I was meditating Queen Map at the same time. So there she is. There's lots of um, glitter things painting in her dress. This is probably the oldest one of these paintings. This is from 2011 and this is the Queen Map of the Fairies and this is Queen Map also but the previous one was done with um, colored pencils. This is watercolor 
And this is really the way I tend to imagine green map in the original fairy goddess form. Fairy goddess because she has horns and I think she's like not really a human but then she's not really entirely a fairy and then she's part of something else as well. I, I can't really explain it. She's a mix of many things and this is really the goddess of the night, the goddess of dreams. So the previous one was the fairy queen in the natural summer world. Then I just finished this one today and it's another queen map. And there's lots of butterflies because she's the spinner goddess. There is some spider web and the hair is purple, bluish because I was thinking the hair of Miranda Richardson in the in Merlin. Even though she doesn't really look like Murder Richardson, because Queen Map always tends to appear to me looking like this. I don't know why. And then, because she is the goddess of fate, she can come out in different forms. So that's why I, <laughs> I have two faces here. I was going to add third faces there as well, but I thought it looked a bit weird after I had finished <laughs> one face. Then I was going to add faces or eyes to the butterfly wings, but that looked really scary. So <laughs> now there's only two faces, but she's the goddess uh, that can triple herself and change her form from tiny creature to human size. So Queen Map is amazing, and there's the moon, which is her symbol. There's the blue and purple colors. She's just gorgeous. And the butterflies, they are of course the symbols of fairies. And in tons, countless of cultures, from Finland to Greece to South America, butterflies are symbols of the soul. So, definitely, soul, butterflies, wings, little birds, goddess map, they're all connected together. So, this was my... Uh, love devotional to goddess map queen map queen of the fairies hail the fairy queen the powerful the archetype of the fairy queen is very powerful like when you want to get something in your life and was it then to be more creative to write more to paint more to sing more to love more to imagine things more queen a fairy queen can help you, fairy queen can assist you, fairies tend to be very pretty nice in our modern day society thanks to Victorians and children books and uh, Tinkerbell. <laughs> the original myth of the fairies is so much deeper and so much wider and so much more psychological and more interesting that it's definitely worth looking Fairies, they are really close to humans in that sense that they are not purely evil and they are not purely good. So they are not devils and they are not angels. They are like humans. Fairies like to trick people. Fairies like to give favors for people. Sometimes fairies like to marry people. So fairies and people, humans. We are all very close to each other. There's so many different ways you can work with fairies and the ways you can work with the archetype of the fairy queen. For me it is sharing my knowledge about the fairies to the world or just to paint fairy art, just to be creative in general and give thanks uh, to nature or always all the time because I can feel her presence in the creative flow and in the cycle of the earth. <laughs> this really became a love song for, from me to the fairy queen. So thank you for uh, thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to my channel to 
bit more. Take care guys and many blessings. Bye bye.